Greetings, folks, and welcome to Goblin Market. I think for this talk, I'm going to probably bounce around a fair bit as, uh, well, as this is a poem that I find seems to inspire bouncing around a fair bit. You've probably noticed I'm not working from PowerPoints right now. To be perfectly honest, I thought it might be nice to just talk without that particular constraint and see how things go. So, what is this little monster of a poem about, anyway? Superficially, it's actually pretty simple, isn't it? Laura and Lizzie, two young women living alone in the countryside, tend to hear the songs of goblin fruit sellers trying to sell their wares. Lizzie is the cautious one, who's inclined not only not to try the fruit, but to try not to even hear or see the goblins. Laura is the curious one, and her curiosity gets her into trouble, doesn't it? She trades a lock of her hair for a whole lot of fruit, but then never hears the goblin cries again and can never get that particular fruit again, and begins, as the poem goes on, to decline towards what looks like premature old age and what is likely to be a premature grave unless Lizzie saves her. So Lizzie, of course, goes out to confront the goblins, manages to get herself smeared with all kinds of fruit during a very erotically charged attempt on their part to force her to eat what they are selling. And through that act of heroism and potential sacrifice on Lizzie's part, Laura ends up being saved, and they both get married and have children. But within this sort of simple folktale-like framework, there is a lot going on, and a lot of it is related to folktales and other mythological motifs, but there are also other discourses going on in here as well, aren't there? So what I think I'd like to do is take a look at a few of them. I know we're not going to exhaust the possibilities in one talk, but that's fine because, of course, we're going to be having a tutorial on the subject anyway, and I'm going to want to know what you folks think. Maybe we should start, then, by, um, well, by thinking about the main characters, Laura and Lizzie. These are two young women living in the countryside who make their living apparently farming, and who therefore live fairly close to the land. They're described as sisters, and the fact that their names alliterate draws them poetically close together as well. In fact, I think their names do a fair bit of work, aside from just drawing them together. If we look at the, uh, the vowels in their names and their characters, there seems to be sort of a, a compatibility or a consonance there between the two. Laura, her, her, the vowels in her name are open vowels, and she's the one who's open to experience. She's the one who's curious, who wants to go out and, and taste what the goblins have to offer. It gets her into trouble, but honestly, she's the one with whose character I am in the most initial sympathy. Lizzie, on the other hand, the vowels in her, in her name are, are close vowels. They're, they're, they're not open. And she not only is less curious than Laura, she actively tries not to see, not to hear. She's willfully ignorant of what is out there. So both of the characters do at the beginning of the poem, we might say have, I wouldn't say a deficiency, but there's ways in which perhaps they both need to change. Laura to realize perhaps the limits of of experience, and Lizzie to go beyond the the safe but quite frankly very limiting confines of uh, of innocence. But of course, the poem isn't called Laura and Lizzie Market; it's called Goblin Market, and we should probably say something about the goblins. These are strange creatures, aren't they? For one thing, no two of them seem to be alike. They're, they're all described as hybrids. There's a cat face, a rat face. There's one that is snail-like, which is really interesting as well. Um, I find that to be particularly maybe a little disturbing because it's not even mammalian. So the hybridity is very wide-ranging. They're also described as walking backwards. That is, they're humanoid, but they're also uncanny in that Freudian sense of being simultaneously familiar and unfamiliar. 
and and this makes them very disturbing to picture. They're small, and they seem friendly when you first meet them, but of course, we find later on that they're not friendly at all, don't we? And another detail about the goblins that is particularly important, one of the most important details in the poem, is that they're all male. They are described as goblin men, so this is an encounter or confrontation between two human women and a whole bunch of goblin men. It's a gendered encounter, and we need to read it that way. It's also an encounter between individuals and a mob. Although each of the goblins is described as having different features, they swarm, don't they? They crowd in around Laura and Lizzie and try to force them to eat or just offer thing after thing after thing. They don't really have an individuality aside from their particular hybridity. Aside from that, they're just part of this amorphous, fruit-selling, whatever that means, mass of backward-walking, semi-human men who are obviously predatory in their nature. And their predatory nature does certainly have sexual overtones, doesn't it? Take a look at this passage here, fairly early on, in page 3 of the, uh, of the Dover edition. Backwards up the mossy glen turned and trooped the goblin men, with their shrill repeated cry, Come by, come by. When they reached where Laura was, they stood stock still upon the moss, leering at each other, brother with queer brother, signaling each other, brother with sly brother. Okay, there are a few things going on there, aren't there? The leer is... is obvious that this these are not innocent creatures are they and their intentions are obviously not generous so really this is a highly sexualized encounter from the outset another thing i'd like to point out here is that they're referred to as brothers that is sibling words here are not necessarily being used in their strictest application this is true of brothers, and I think, quite frankly, it's also true of sisters. I'm thinking of people in unions who call themselves brothers and sisters without being blood relatives. There are lots of contexts in which people call each other brother and sister without actually being siblings. This seems to be one of those. More on that later. In the meantime, we should probably talk a bit about currency, shouldn't we? Laura wants the fruit, but she doesn't have any money. As she says, Good folk, I have no coin, to take were to purloin, I have no copper in my purse, I have no silver either, and all my gold is on the furs that shakes in windy weather above the rusty heather. To which they reply, You have much gold upon your head, they answered altogether. Buy from us with a golden curl. She clipped a precious golden lock, she dropped a tear, more rare than pearl, then sucked their fruit globes, fair or red, sweeter than honey from the rock, stronger than man-rejoicing wine, clearer than water flowed that juice she never tasted such before. How could it cloy with length of use? She sucked and sucked and sucked some more, fruit which that unknown orchard bore. She sucked until her lips were sore, then flung the emptied rinds away, but gathered up one kernel stone, and knew not was it night or day, as she turned home alone. And, okay, well, how do we look at that? And the quick answer is, not very innocently. She trades her body for this otherworld fruit, and it is otherworld fruit, and we'll get to what that means in a moment. And here again, there's a lot more going on than the words just say. For example, hair is erotic. Always in paraphyolite art, literature, or poetry, hair is erotic. It's not just erotic there. It's erotic in lots of other situations, too. But in this situation, in these, in these artistic contexts, it is erotic. Hair always has to do with sexuality. So there is a sexual exchange, or a sexualized exchange, at least, that takes place between Lizzie and the goblins. And I think it's entirely possible that there's more than just a sexualized exchange, but rather an actual sexual exchange. Here's why. Later on, when Lizzie is setting out to get fruit to 
cure her sister's need for a fix, basically, because we're, we also find ourselves in the realm of substance abuse, but we'll get to that as well. She reflects back on Jenny. This is the second reference we've had to Jenny, who encountered the goblin men before and then aged prematurely, withered away, grayed, and died. But on page nine, we have this this really kind of dark line, this really dark reference to what actually happened to Jenny. She thought of Jenny in her grave, who should have been a bride, but who for joys brides hoped to have fell sick and died in her gay prime. That who for joys brides hoped to have at a time when brides were assumed to be virginal until the wedding night is a pretty clear reference to intercourse. And what the line suggests very clearly is this is what happened with the goblin men. Now we read that back to Laura and her lock of hair. And we need to bear in mind, of course, that this is highly symbolic poetry. Symbols always can mean more than one thing. But also, in the Victorian period, there were certain things that you couldn't say explicitly. And I think the context in this one, at least with Jenny, is very unambiguous. With Laura, it's ambiguous, but the door's open. Especially when we consider her tears at parting with a lock of her hair. You don't cry when you part with a lock of hair if it's just a lock of hair. Another possibility, of course, and this isn't an either-or situation, but it is simply another possibility, is that she's trading away some part of herself, some, some precious part of herself, however you may wish to read that. And in any case, the highly sensual, very sexualized language that follows with her fruit feast also plays well with the sexual notion of the exchange, or the sexualized notion of the exchange of hair. After the encounter, of course, Laura is quite disoriented. She has no sense of time. She basically stumbles home in a daze and, and can think of nothing else but getting more. But, of course, she never hears or sees the goblins again and, and eventually settles or fades or subsides into a sort of a half-life where she's still breathing, but she's not doing anything. She's simply wasting away for want of this fruit that she can no longer get. And here's where we need to work in the theme, of course, of, of substance abuse where the substance that is needed and, and can't be had becomes all in all, becomes everything, the only thing that the person who is addicted to it can think of, the whole point around which their life revolves, either in its presence or in its absence. And this creates a gap between the sisters, doesn't it? Because now Laura has experience of this thing, Lizzie doesn't, and the ways in which they speak to each other are clearly opposed. So we have on page six that they talked as modest maidens should, Lizzie with an open heart, Laura in an absent dream, one content, one sick in part, one warbling for the mere bright day's delight, one longing for the night, an explicit light-dark opposition here. And I'm reminded of, of what I've both read and heard speaking to people who've had this experience, that with opiates in particular, there is no high like the first high, and an addict will spend their entire life chasing that first high that they can never have again. And we've spoken a fair bit about that already in the context of Laudanum and Branwell Bronte and various characters in the Bronte books, and of course Elizabeth Siddall as well. But I don't want to seem like I'm reading too much in here either, so... I think we should move forward a little bit and, and think about Lizzie as we're moving forward now. This is, this is her turn to shine. She realizes, of course, that her sister is, is fading, is dying. She's seen this happen because we have Jenny as the example, as the cautionary tale. We have Laura who has succumbed to temptation, but also, and here's, again, like I said, I, I'm more sympathetic to Laura than I am to Lizzie. Because Laura is at least curious. Lizzie is, is afraid. She's, she's deliberately confining, constraining, amputating her curiosity about the world outside. Whereas Laura is, 
at least trying to embrace it, to experience it. It's dangerous and it hurts her, but at the beginning she is the more open to experience. But as I said, I want to talk about Lizzie now. And Lizzie's narrative is also a really interesting narrative, isn't it? Lizzie gets to be the hero here. She's the one who goes out to face the monsters and get back from them what she needs to save her sister. So, whereas Laura's quest is the quest of curiosity, the quest for experience, Lizzie's is the quest of the hero, very explicitly heroic. But wait, I have to delay more because I mentioned something earlier that I didn't follow up on, and that is that these are also otherworld creatures. And there is a danger in eating the fruit of the other world. This is the same theme that we're in when we look at, for example, Dante Gabriel Rossetti's Prosperine and and Prosperine's eating of the pomegranates that consign her to spend half of eternity in Hades. That's the other world or underworld fruit. This is also a part of British, particularly Celtic storytelling. If you go to the other world and eat the food there, you can't leave. And if you encounter the fairy folk at night at one of their feasts, and if you drink their wine, or if you eat the food they offer, and it will often be fruit, then they can take you away. So we have all kinds of of folktale and mythological motifs coming in here, don't we? But wait, there's more, because the fruit that Laura eats is explicitly referred to in the poem as the forbidden fruit, which also invokes Christian mythology. So we have all of these layers in here, don't we? Multiple mythologies, physical and psychological addiction, obsession, and I'm sure there are some that I haven't even mentioned yet. All of which, of course, we have to bear in mind when Lizzie goes out to face the goblins. And she approaches very differently, doesn't she? She doesn't want to. And we're told that she looked for the first time. She's averted her eyes from the world that was around her up to this point. So, yes, while Lizzie is heroic, part of her heroism is overcoming her piety, overcoming her adherence to the accepted rules of conduct, and being able to go beyond them. Because, of course, this is the quintessential heroic stance, isn't it? The hero is the one who goes beyond. And whatever follows beyond, grammatically call it X, the hero goes beyond that. Beyond limits, beyond piety, beyond decency, beyond expectation. To stay within limits, even acknowledged good limits, is quintessentially unheroic. Lizzie has to go beyond the limits to save her sister. But it's also important to point out two things. One, she goes prepared. She takes money and is prepared to trade money rather than herself for what she is looking for. And two, she's acting out of love for somebody else. She's not acting out of selfish interest. She is putting herself at risk for another. Now, given that we are working within, among other things, a Christian framework, this puts Lizzie in the savior position, doesn't it? This puts Lizzie in the martyr position because she does come very close to martyring herself. She is beaten, she is assaulted, and the affront, the attack to her is also a highly sexualized attack. And we'll pick up before things get nasty, just as the goblins are approaching. This is on page 10. Laughed every goblin when they spied her peeping, came toward her hobbling, flying, running, leaping, puffing and blowing, chuckling, clapping, crowing, clucking and gobbling, mopping and mowing, full of airs and graces, pulling wry faces, demure grimaces, cat-like and rat-like, rattel and wombat-like, snail-paced in a hurry, parrot-voiced and whistler, helter-skelter, hurry-scurry, chattering like magpies, fluttering like pigeons, gliding like fishes, hugged her and kissed her, squeezed her and caressed her, stretched up their dishes, panniers and plates, Look at our apples, russet and dun, bob at our cherries, bite at our peaches, citrons and dates, grapes for the asking, 
Pears red with basking out in the sun, plums on their twigs, pluck them and suck them, pomegranates, figs. Good folk, said Lizzie, mindful of Jenny, give me much and many, held out her apron, tossed them her penny, nay, take a seat with us, honour and eat with us. They answered, grinning, our feast is but beginning. Night yet is early, warm and dew pearly, wakeful and starry, such fruits as these no man can carry, half their bloom would fly, half their dew would dry, half their flavour would pass by. Sit down and feast with us, be welcome guest with us, cheer you and rest with us. Thank you, said Lizzie, but one waits at home alone for me, so without further parleying, if you will not sell me any of your fruits, though much and many, give me back my silver penny, I tossed you for a fee. They began to scratch their pates, no longer wagging, purring, but visibly demurring, grunting and snarling, one called her proud, cross-grained, uncivil, their tones waxed loud, their looks were evil, lashing their tails, they trod and hustled her, elbowed and jostled her, clawed with their nails, barking, mewing, hissing, mocking, tore her gown and soiled her stocking twitched her hair out by the roots, stamped upon her tender feet, held her hands, and squeezed their fruits against her mouth to make her eat. White and golden Lizzie stood like a lily in the flood, like a rock of blue-veined stone lashed by tides obstreperously, like a beacon left alone in a hoary, roaring sea, sending up a golden fire like a fruit-crowned orange tree, white with blossoms, honey-sweet, sore beset by wasp and bee, like a royal virgin town, topped with gilded dome and spire, close beleaguered by a fleet, mad to tug her standard down. One may lead a horse to water, twenty cannot make him drink, though the goblins cuffed and caught her, coaxed and fought her, bullied and besought her, scratched her, pinched her black as ink, kicked and knocked her, mauled and mocked her, Lizzie uttered not a word, would not open lip from lip, lest they should cram a mouthful in, but laughed in heart to feel the drip of juice that syruped all her face, and lodged in dimples of her chin, and streaked her neck which quaked like curd, at last the evil people, Worn out by her resistance, flung back her penny, kicked their fruit along whichever road they took, not leaving root or stone or shoot. Some writhed into the ground, some dived into the brook with ring and ripple, some scudded on a gale without a sound, some vanished in the distance. And as for where to approach this scene or how to approach this scene, in case you missed it, I'm going to start with the heroic the Homeric simile that Rossetti uses to describe Lizzie's resistance. It's an extended simile with images of, for example, a town under siege by, by a besetting force. This is Homeric to a T. And the employing, the use of that Homeric simile tells us everything we need to know about how Rossetti sees Lizzie. The difference, though, is that her heroism is not an offensive heroism. It's defensive. It's actually passive. She's heroic in resisting. She's heroic in keeping herself physically closed and frustrating the desires of the men, if you'll excuse my bluntness, to put things inside her. That is, her heroism is a refusal to be a passive object. She is the one who maintains control in this situation. And eventually, in their frustration, they leave and they melt away to nothing. And the way in which they do so is fantastic, isn't it? They just, they, 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 they blow away on the wind, they dive into the water, they melt into the ground. These are elemental figures. These are elemental creatures. And, and their, their inhumanness is really highlighted more really in the manner of their disappearance than even in their hybrid forms. But their humanness is most, most fully displayed, unfortunately, in their violent sexual masculinity, which Lizzie heroically frustrates. And when she returns finally home, she's a mess. She's beaten, she's bruised, she's cut, she's covered in fruit juice. And again, given the nature of the assault, this also has to be 
read, I think, with some degree of erotic imagery, especially when we have the following exchange between Laura and Lizzie. She cried, Laura, up the garden. Did you miss me? Come and kiss me. Never mind my bruises. Hug me, kiss me, suck my juices. Squeezed from goblin fruits for you. Goblin pulp and goblin dew. Eat me, drink me, love me. Laura, make much of me. For your sake I have braved the glen and had to do with goblin merchantmen. On which, of course, Laura is devastated, fearing that her sister has doomed herself in trying to save her. But Lizzie makes clear that she hasn't eaten anything as in, and is in fact fine, and then has herself be basically consumed by her sister. And this as well is given in very powerful, very suggestive language. We'll continue with the scene. Lizzie, Lizzie, have you tasted for my sake the fruit forbidden? Must your light like mine be hidden, your young life like mine be wasted, undone in mine undoing? and ruined in my ruin, thirsty, cankered, goblin-ridden. She clung about her sister, kissed and kissed and kissed her. Tears once again refreshed her shrunken eyes, dropping like rain after long, sultry drouth. Shaking with anguish, fear, and pain, she kissed and kissed her with a hungry mouth. Her lips began to scorch. That juice was wormwood to her tongue. She loathed the feast. Writhing as one possessed, she leapt and sung, rent all her robe and wrung her hands in lamentable haste and beat her breast. Her locks streamed like the torch, borne by a racer at full speed, or like the mane of horses in their flight, or like an eagle when she stems the light straight toward the sun, or like a caged thing free, or like a flying flag when armies run. Swift fire spread through her veins, knocking at her heart, met the fire smoldering there, and overbore its lesser flame. She gorged on bitterness without a name. Ah, fool, to choose such part of soul-consuming care. Sense failed in the mortal strife. Like the watchtower of a town, which an earthquake shatters down, like a lightning-stricken mast, like a wind-rooted tree spun about, like a foam-topped water-spout cast down headlong in the sea, she fell at last, pleasure past and anguish past. Is it life or is it death? After which, of course, comes her rebirth, and you've read it already, so I won't read the whole rest of the poem to you, but there are details here that I really want to focus on. One, we get another Homeric-like simile with Laura, so the two are, are paired in that sense as well. But more importantly, the encounter between the two of them is also, I think, erotically charged. And this is where I read the word sister as not necessarily meaning sibling. Just as with the goblins, brother doesn't necessarily mean sibling, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Lizzie's language here, eat me, drink me, love me, is pretty sexy stuff, but it's also deeply imbued with religious imagery. Because in making a sacrifice of herself, which Lizzie does, and then coming home to be eaten and drunken by her dying sister, she makes a, a living Eucharist out of herself. And it's in consuming the Eucharist of her, quote, sister, unquote, that Laura becomes reborn. Add to this that contrary to what is common in heroic poetry, and this, as we've seen, is drawing on heroic motifs, the only characters who have names in this one are the women. The goblins don't get names, and later on, when Laura and Lizzie are mothers, neither their children nor, more importantly, their husbands get names. They remain who they are, which means everybody else in the poem has their identity relative to them. They don't have their identity relative to other people. And with its closing praise of sisters being the ones who will stick by you, as the closing goes, to strengthen whilst one stands, the only line in the poem, by the way, that doesn't rhyme, a very strong ending, the poem is explicitly addressing itself, I think, to a community of women who support each other against goblins and other man-monsters. 
So in the end, what we have is on the one hand, what is I think pretty clearly a same sex relationship between Lizzie and Laura, if not explicitly, and I think it is fairly explicit, then at least implicitly. We also have, as I said, a community of women drawing strength from each other against assaults from outside and also constructing their own identity on their own terms rather than relative to a man or men. And notice also when Lizzie wouldn't give the goblin men their way, they started calling her proud and full of herself and various other insults, um, kind of the way guys talk about, about women who don't give them what they want, unfortunately, very often. She wasn't the kind of woman they, they wanted her to be, so they more or less called her a bitch. But also bound up with this emotional and erotic relationship is a religious relationship, a spiritual relationship. This is also a story of rebirth. A rebirth where the saving agent is not a man. The saving agent is also a woman. That is, when Laura needs salvation... She doesn't need salvation from Christ. She needs salvation from Lizzie. And Lizzie is the one who gets it for her. So the world of the poem is a world of monstrous men and women clinging to each other for love and company and rebirth. And in the end, when Laura is speaking to her children and looking back on her past, there is, I think, a sense of, of regret there that she misses Lizzie, because of course it wasn't acceptable at the time for women to live together, was it? Homosexuality happened, of course, but it wasn't socially acceptable. It had to be done undercover. There's a lot of cover in this poem. But it is, I think, when you look under all of that cover, a poem that revolves around women loving women and making their own narratives around their own experiences to the frustration of the narratives that are imposed upon them by the man-goblins by whom they are constantly beset.